Okay. Um, so thanks for coming to the, to the evening session. So this is uh, we'll be wrapping up the symposium of this round table. Um, so I thought that what we could do is, is change the format a little bit since yesterday uh, we ran the round table by having the participants ask each other questions. And I thought maybe for this evening, uh, because we're maybe in a little bit more of a summary mode, it might be interesting just to, um, to put forward um, three topics for discussion um, that then we can all uh, engage. Um, and then also I want to leave some time for uh, questions Final questions from the floor, since we also weren't able to do that last night. Hopefully, we'll have a little bit more more time this evening. Um, and so, the three broad questions that I thought might draw together some of the concerns of the two papers, and then the final one um, that might allow us to wrap up a little bit, are, are the following. So, the first one is um, uh, on the basis of Alberto's paper to try to think through um, the question of the relevance of money to sophistical practice, since this, of course, is a key uh, aspect of the, of the definition of the sophist in ancient Greece um, that differentiates the sophist from the platonic philosopher. So to think about what difference the fact that the sophist is paid makes to sophistical practice and its relation to philosophy. And that might also give us an opportunity to think through um, the relation of that question to, to psychoanalysis, where, of course, part of the point is that, uh, that the analyst um, is paid um, and, and is therefore uh, occupies the sort of position um, structurally in relation to, to money and exchange um, of the sophist. And maybe that would allow us to engage Zon Rethel as well in this, this question of um, uh, the slippage in his account um, of the exchange relation prior to capitalism, et cetera, that, that you raised during your paper. And then the second um, topic I thought would be productive um, is to take up more explicitly this question of sophistry in relation to Ray's paper. So Ray, you mentioned um, that sophistry was in your title, but you wouldn't have an opportunity to address it um, too directly. So I thought we could take up the question of how um, the framework um, that you're uh, introducing here, and then the, and then the question of um, uh, and also just the, the theory of reason that we get in that framework, how that is related to the question of sophistry. Um, so how we can think about inferentialism in relation to sophistry, how we can think about its sort of epistemological framework um, in relation to sophistry and, and philosophy. How it adjudicates that question, if you want. And maybe how it intervenes in the history of philosophy. And I think Barbara also mentioned that she might be interested in talking about um, uh, Hegel's account of sophistry. Uh, in, in ancient Greece, and so how um, we might think about Brandon's Hegel in relation to, mm. to that question. And then the third, uh, the third point I think we could talk about is just um, at, at, uh, suggestions from some people uh, attending, actually. Um, just a general account of, um, among the, the three uh, keynotes, of, of how we see the sort of vocation of philosophical practice or sophistical practice. What's the point? What's the sort of um, image of philosophy um, that we can think about in relation to sophistry or what you're calling sophistical practice? Um, and that might allow us to engage things on kind of broad, within a broad framework to wrap up. And there was, there was also a suggestion uh, from Petard that it, that it might be productive also um, in that final topic to think about the relation of, of philosophy um, not only to sophistry, but also to anti-philosophy, or potentially to non-philosophy, um, some of these contemporary frameworks for thinking about the question. So those are the three things I have in mind, and of course anyone, you know, we should raise any questions that we have as we go. Um, and Alberto, I think you also wanted to talk about the sort of uh, different version of the history of philosophy that Ray's account might enable us to discuss, and maybe we could bring that up in the second section on, on, uh, on sophistry in his paper. Um, and, then, and then, yeah, we should have time for, for questions at the end. So let's start with this. Um, someone will have to decide who wants to speak first. But uh, let's start with this question of um, just the fact that the sophist is the one whose discourse is paid for um, and how that matters to this distinction between mm -hmm. philosophy, philosophy and sophistry in general, perhaps, and also in particular in ancient Greece. Would anyone like to lead us off? Yeah. Well, I, I just want to, uh, on this topic to ask a question. Uh, okay. Uh, to Alberto, 
Um, well, it's very precise, you see. Um, when um, uh, Zon Ratel hmm? mm -hmm. yeah, said, uh, well, you said, um, he said that uh, um, ontological con convertibility is located in the social practices of ancient Greece. Hmm? So this is uh, what I want you to develop, and I can, for my part, introduce one, um, one Aristotelian fact you know, and uh, it will open, I think, larger questions just on this topic. I, I uh, spoke yesterday of epideixis as the um, anti apodeixis or as, as the other way of, discurs of being a discursive um, man. And um, this word, epideixis, has been used once by Aristotle to uh, describe something else than the rhetorical epideixis, that is the uh, praise, okay? And this, this was about the invention of capitalism. Uh, it's precisely that, you know? It's about uh, Thales, who, um, is who knows who is a very wise man. Mm? He knows a lot of things. He's a sophos, a savant, okay? And uh, he knows especially astronomy. And you know what happened to Thales. He fall down in a puits, well. in a well, and there is a, a Tracian uh, maid, who uh, laughing, uh, that uh, philosopher, uh, okay. And so he wanted to show that a philosopher is able of something else. And he look at the sky, uh, make, make in practice of his astronomy uh, knowledge, and uh, be sure that this summer will be particularly hot and particularly dry. And then he let all the pressures, you know, the olive pressures of the region, of the area, at a moment where no olives were there. And when the olives were there, every owner of olives has to let one pressure, and very high. And so he managed to be the first capitalist. Hmm? And it is said like that, except the word capital is not, is not uh, pronounced, of course. But really, he made money with that. And uh, Aristotle alludes to this fact twice. One is in the politics, and one is in the eth Nicomachean ethics. And the point is, what is really the relationship between ethics and politics? But uh, Aristotle said that both times that this was an epideixis. And in uh, the Nicomachean ethics, which described that long, long, long time, uh, you know, during uh, half a page, let us me, let me say. Uh, it is said that Thales is Sophos, but not Phronimos. That's to say he's wise, if you want, or he is uh, savant. Mm? Sage et savant, Sophos means both. But he's not, um, I don't know, how do you, do you translate Phronimos? He's not uh, prudent. Mm -hmm. mm? He's wise, but not prudent. And so, in this circumstance, he is a sophist. So, uh, it, I think it's very interesting, because, of course, Marx knows that oh, very, very well. Huh? Marx is one of the best readers of Aristotle I ever met. Uh, ever not met, but... Encounter. <laughs> 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 So, um, 
this is the, the, the fact, you know, I wanted to, to add to your, um, and, and to agreement my question. Mm, that's a very uh, uh, great um, sort of philosophical figure or, or tale. I mean, first, a, a couple of just comments right off the bat. I mean, I think it's, it's quite ironic that at least in your in your in your retelling of it, then it turns out that capitalism is philosophy's revenge against plebs. You know, so it's philosophy's revenge against this, you know, this it is. plebeian woman's scorn. It's like yes. ha. And that you know, and that the revenge takes the form of some sort of uh, financial speculation uh, on the future. So that's you know, that, that there's an irony uh, there, I suppose. I mean in terms of uh, in terms of Zonreto's argument, the thing that's both attractive and very, um, or at least for me, was initially attractive, but at the same time is very constraining about it, and is also the reason why it was met already in the 1930s uh, by Horkheimer, yeah. who personally blocked the funding of uh, the uh, uh, institute to Zanleto, who Adorno was very fond of, and so Horkheimer. Uh, it's a very complicated story, uh, which really tells you something about, I mean, speaking of money and, and, and philosophy, which tells you, I mean, you get this also when you read Benjamin's letters, I mean, the huge amounts of, of, of uh, hustling and uh, for these projects, and then the fact that in many ways, um, you know, Horkheimer is this kind of like financial choke point. So if he decides that you're not getting the money, at least at that moment, it seems like. So then Benjamin has to write a report about Zonaletal, and then Marcuse, and they have these meetings, and then it's, I won't really fund your project, but I'll fund an essay. I mean, there's really a very complicated uh, relationship that has to do uh, uh, with the role of money. But now what Horkheimer criticizes in Zonaletal is the formalism, which he sees as related to uh, a kind of sociologism uh, and to the influence in some ways of, uh, of Zimmel and in some ways influence of Neo-Kantian philosophy, etc., etc. That's a different story. In Zonreto's case, though, the, interest, the, the, the question is that he's looking for the presence, I guess in his case, not so much of capitalism, and it's interesting that this, this temporal dimension is absent, this dimension of speculation, yes. of finance, is not really so relevant directly to Zanreto, his interest is in the presence of what he calls the exchange abstraction, that is to say, the um, practically abstract character of the activities of market exchange that involve money. So, um, and he, uh, in, in the book, he, uh, says the following, he says, and this is an intellectual Emmanuel labor, so the one book he was working on for, for 60 years or whatever. Um, the act of exchange has to be described, he writes, as abstract movement through abstract, homogeneous, continuous, and empty space, and time of abstract substances, materially real but bare sense qualities, which thereby suffer no material change and which allow none but quantitative differentiation differentiation and abstract non-dimensional quantity. Curiously, like his uh, British uh, Marxist uh, uh, classicist friend, George Thompson, he thinks that you can already, and in fact, this is also the argument in a way in Richard Seaford's book, Money and the Early Greek Mind, is that you can find this very elementary exchange abstraction, very, very elementary, very formal and stripped down exchange abstraction already in uh, pre-Socratic philosophy. And in fact, that ends up being for both Thompson and then Seaford, even though Seaford also writes about Plato, but then it becomes much more complicated because it's about the relationship between money and theories of intelligence and theories of worth, and then it's a much more complicated and mediated story. But at this level of the exchange abstraction of how, how does the thought of um, matter without qualities, how does the thought of, of, of pure quantitative differentiation? How does this thought of exchange arise? That's where he sees the, the unconscious role. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. one can then argue, I'm just, I'm just describing the sort of source yeah, yeah. of the theory, in the unconscious uh, uh, impact of these two linked relationships, mm -hmm. um, market or, or, or commodity exchange and monetization. Now, 
Uh, and then he, you know, and, and uh, uh, um, you know, this involves, as it does at much more length in Seaford, uh, discussions of these uses also of, of money as a, a kind of uh, philosophical or ontological metaphor, like the famous uh, Her Heraclitus uh, passage, all things are in exchange for fire and fire for all things, like goods for gold and gold for goods. So this kind of, um, th that's, that's in a sense the, the argument. So curiously, the, 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 the actual, like the much more dense social practices, and indeed certainly the much more complex uh, class and gender and other relations of ancient Greece are sort of uh, somewhat peripheral to this incredibly formalistic account, which is just based on this kind of intuition and whose aim is then to, um, to carry on into a critique of the role of the monetary forms in um, philosophical cognition, scientific cognition. In fact, the book is actually called a critique mm -hmm. of epistemology in some okay. so it's So that's, in a sense, the, the story, which also means that um, in, in Zonleto's account, then this um, question of, of money's direct, let's say, relationship to the shape of thinking and to sophistry and so on is not really such... Um, such a concern, sure, I suppose. Yeah, um, so that I mean, that's the first. Yeah. That's in a sense the first thing that comes to mind, which is also uh, again why it's a very different. I mean, it's very unrelated as um, as an argument to uh, the argument to the arguments made by. Marx about Aristotle's actual economic thought. This is, in yes. a sense, why it ends up being this argument about the uh, uh, about mm. the um, the founding parameters of abstract thought in pre-Socratic philosophy, much more than what does Aristotle actually think about the economy, yeah. which ends up not being an object of. Yeah. Uh, uh, of, of reflection, of, 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 of reason writers. But of course, there is the, the, the link between all that is time. You're mm -hmm. perfectly right. Uh, um, uh, it's speculation needs time, discourse needs time if you want to discourse uh, sophistically. Mm -hmm. I mean, and um, if I can make the link, I think it's, it's important to understand why psychoanalysis can be implied also. Mm -hmm. Um, well, of course, speculation needs time, it's evident, and the way uh, Aristotle speaks of tokos, hmm? tokos which means child and fee, and uh, do you say fee? Uh, fee, no. payment? Uh, no, not payment, it's um, uh, c'est le, les intérêts. Ah, interest. Interest, okay, the interest of, uh, ah, yes, of uh, okay. yes. So this is tokos. Tokos is... <sighs> You know, uh, what needs time to make mm. uh, a child? You need time and then it grows up and then etc. So it's, perfect, it's perfectly, uh, on the point is perfectly time. And the discursivity of the sophistic, the so sophist, is the one which needs time or which ex exploits time. Mm. I mean, when you see Plateau, he, um, the discourse is, or, or Aristotle, discourse is topoi, schlack, schlack, schlack. You cut where, where, where there is a, a joint, a joint, yeah, and you cut well. It, it's all on you, on your eyes. Huh? A discourse well made in rhetorics, Platonico-Aristotelian rhetoric, uh, Phaedra, or rhetoric, Aristotle's rhetoric. It's something that has a space, a space, <coughs> it's a spatial, spatial mm. thing. Mm. When you are going to sophistics, it's absolutely not that way of thinking discourse, it's a time way. It, uh, um, and uh, that's why I, I made the point of, uh, on Kairos yesterday, but it's not, it's not only the, um, the only thing, is that if you want to really hear what is passing, then you are at the same time Gorgias and a psychoanalyst. When you say, um, I say it in Greek first, to me on 
est mais on. The non-being is non-being. You begin to say, the non-being, oh, it's an entity. This is the, the crit, uh, so Plato's criticism in Sophist. What, Plato, what Parmenid does is absolutely silly. He says, to me on, so it exists. Huh? You say, to, the, and, and you, you, you say it's a singular, so it exists. It's a, it's a singular with an article, okay? And the article means that it is a subject, a possible subject in Greek. Uh, in Greek, you say, ho Socrates est Socrates, le Socrate, the Socrate is Socrate. You distinguish subject and predicate in this way. So when you say, to meon, it's already a subject. Then you say, to meon esti, the non-being is. Ah, oh, says Gorias, you see it is. Mm, you see what you said. Ah, oh, non-being is. Ah, oh, it's sure. And then, the non-being is non-being. Oh, it, it is non-being, so it doesn't exist. And, uh, but is doesn't mean the same thing in the first part of your sentence when you say the non-being is, and when in the whole sentence when you say the non-being is non-being. How oh, strange, it's equivoque. You play on that. So this is the criticism Gorgias made to Parmenides. Hmm? It's absolutely uh, imparable. You cannot stop it if ever you be c uh, careful with the time of discourse, with the dis of discursivity. And um, um, uh, at the end of all the story, Elius Aristide says, uh, which is a sophist of the second sophistic, uh, the discourse is walking with the same, in the same path than time. This is absolutely the point. And the, the link between money, mm. hmm, making money, making more money, and uh, speaking as a sophist is time. That's a... Uh, that's actually a really interesting uh, point vis-a-vis -vis the something that I, I had no idea why I missed it out in, in Zolhetel's argument. But what is actually crucial to his argument and crucial to his understanding of the social practice of market exchange is that in the, in the, um, in the structure of exchange itself, in the act uh, uh, of exchanging, which involves abstracting for the time and in the space, Mm -hmm. of the market from use. You're not using products as you buy them. Mm -hmm. So there's a logical, there's, there's so to speak a, mm -hmm. a grammar to the act of exchange yes. mm -hmm. that involves what he calls the purely social postulate that things can exist outside of time. Mm -hmm. So the, the market depends on the fiction mm -hmm. um, uh, that the uh, objects of exchange, and it's a fiction that's of course enabled by the really abstract form of money and its capacity to, to quantify and separate things from their use, mm -hmm. that this allows the, a social practice, uh, which is a social practice that of course takes place in space and time, there's nothing but, you know, it's a purely spatial temporal practice, you're in the market, you're buying something, etc., yes. but whose grammar is atemporal. So he says the sentence, which I think is quite interesting because it's, the obverse of this very important argument about accumulation, time, money, and sophistry that you just made. He says the exchange abstraction is the, and this is why he thinks it's important to Marx, the exchange abstraction is the historical, spatial-temporal origin of atemporal, ahistorical thought. Mm -hmm. So in, in some sense, the idea is that particular conjuncture of market exchange and monetization makes possible or occasions or mm -hmm. conditions, and we can think about those different mm -hmm, mm -hmm. modes, the emergence of a thinking, a, f a specifically abstract philosophical thinking of substances or matter as something that is outside of space and time. So that's the sort of play, and which is why, um, and I can't resist this partly because we've had a few uh, 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 mentions of, um, of animals, uh, partly which is, and in fact you were talking about different forms of animal cognition, this is why for Marx, animals can, uh, for, for Zonretel, uh, animals can't uh, understand money, mm -hmm. uh, precisely because of this atemporal uh, character. So he writes in this famous little vignette, 
uh, in, in Intellectual Manual Labor. He says, money is an abstract thing, an abstract thing, mm -hmm. a paradox in itself, a thing that performs its socially synthetic function without any human understanding. So it's not about what people think about commerce or exchange. And yet, it's about something totally anti, non-intellectual and only intellectual. That's the other paradox. And yet, no animal can ever grasp the meaning of money. It is accessible only to man. So in some sense, the specificity of man would be to be the only animal that can understand money. Mm -hmm. Take your dog with you to the butcher and watch how much he understands of the goings-on when you purchase your meal. It is a great deal and even includes a keen sense of property, so animals understand mm -hmm. property, which will make him snap at a stranger's hand, daring to come near the meat of his master, um, and which he will be allowed to carry home in his mouth. But when you have to tell him, wait doggy, I haven't paid yet, his understanding is at an end. The pieces of metal or paper which he watches you hand over and which carry your scent, he knows of course, he has seen them before but their function as money lies outside the animal range. So that's, in a, in a sense, a kind of mm -hmm. um, vignette precisely about this idea that there's something about the historical birth of timelessness, which is what he's concerned with, which is also why he really has very little to say uh, about this thing that I think is really, uh, really fascinating when you brought out, which is a kind of pre-capitalist in the Marxian sense of capitalism, but pre-capitalist, capitalist thinking, so to speak, about speculation, about finance, uh, uh, you know, about accumulation and, and so on. Well, if I can just add a sure. sentence. Yeah. Uh, it's Protagoras one, you know. Yeah. Pantum crematum, uh, metron, anthropometron. It means of all and we translate things, but, but this word means uh, uh, richesse. Wealth. Wealth. Oh, really? Cremata. Yes, mm. yes. Cremata is first when you, and the plural, you know, it's a plural. So when you seek in dictionaries, the first meaning is wealth. Then uh, Heidegger, and it, I think he's right, Etymologize this with care, the, the, the hand. Mm -hmm. mm? So it's every ostensility. Mm? Mm -hmm. All the ostensils are. The tools. The two. Well, what, what you have in, in hand, what you can have in hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm? So tool, if you want, yeah. but you know. Utensil. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 okay. yeah. So, and, and it means useful. Mm -hmm. So uh, all this are the meanings enclosed in crémata whose measure is man. It's, and uh, you can, of course, uh, begin to think to the, to the um, uh, relationship between money and words. Yeah. And the way man is also the, manner, the measure of meanings. So that's, uh, all this is in Protagoras' uh, explanation. Mm -hmm. So krenata is a key word. Well, it strikes me that, um, that one thing maybe that psychoanalysis teaches about sophistry is that that's, that's already latent in sophistry is that perhaps sophistry really does understand something about the relation between um, well, reason and irrationality and its relation to money. Mm -hmm. there is actually some crucial, crucial and constitutive relation that needs to be addressed there. And the, and the sophist is the one who, okay, we can say it's out of greed or whatever, but also um, puts that relation in play. And it seems to me there are two crucial inversions that take place, first in the relation of psychoanalysis to sophistry, and then within psychoanalysis itself. And the first is that um, in, sof in, in sophistry you're paying for discourse to be taught, and it's a kind of therapy, of course. Um, that is to say, it's supposed to improve you. Um, in psychoanalysis, you're paying for silence. You're paying to be listened to. Um, and you're the producer of speech, and the psychoanalyst, for the most part, doesn't you know, say too much. Um, and then this also undergoes this very curious inversion that has to do with uh, the standardization of time in Lacan and the scandal of the short session. Because the scandal of the short session, of course, is that it seems like there's a kind of vanishing point at which you're paying for just to pay. Okay. You know, that you, you sort of uh, close in on this point where you pay for no time. 
Mm. You know, it's possible. You just pay to pay. Oh, you pay for and, euros. Well, okay, sure. <laughs> you and pay so for it's, euros. And, and so, and so <laughs> you're sort of purely just paying for like pure time, but not a duration of time. Yes. So that's, yeah. And, uh, and I think that um, it's very important then that Lacan, you know, understands something about the relationship between discourse and the standardization of time. That is to say, time only really matters um, to the relation between reason and irrationality in discourse when there is some pressure placed on its duration. That is to say, it's not a standardized unit of time that you're paying for, but rather you don't know when the session is going to be interrupted. Um, and so this de-standardizes the time of analysis in this really crucial way that I think bears upon the unconscious. Um, and so it seems to me that, yeah, there is this complex sort of um, history of inversions and rethinkings of the relationship between time and discourse that carries itself out between sophistry and psychoanalysis in the 20th century. But at least we can say the sophist, you know, it's not just this like ethical fault, right? That there is something really crucially in play between time and reason in, in sophistical practice. What is reason? Well, okay. I mean, no, sorry, uh, because uh, you know. Well, it's, in Freud, it's, I mean, uh, so the what so word? The, so what the, Greek word is it? That's the point. Uh -huh. uh, well, you tell me. <laughs> but uh, but there is none. Uh, uh, logos has been translated well, by yeah. ratio and oratio. Uh -huh. So uh, that's the point. There is no difference. You can translate logos. Uh, it it has been translated by ratio. And well, ratio has been translated by raison. Well, let's say so that's, that's uh, the I point. Think that what interests me, and the point is that in the relation to psychoanalysis, you know, when, when in Plato's diagnosis of the sophist, when he basically says, you know, the sophist says words, and they seem to have meaning, but they don't have meaning. You know, so it's that, that something like that kind of pure sense, but which does not have something like a rational meaning that seems crucial to to Plato, at least we could think about it that in relation to psychoanalysis, where we have something like the manifest irrationality of speech or discourse, um, well, which doesn't operate precisely in the way that, that someone like Brandom is, is looking for uh, as a criterion of reason. You know, I ask you for reasons and you give me your reasons, but they're not real reasons. Um, so it's not, it's, it's excluded from the realm of the rational. So it's not that I want to necessarily or maybe I do, but my point here is not is not to say that um, is not to draw some line that I would want to define between reason and rationality, but just to say that that sort of uh, limit or problem is in play in discourse vis-a-vis -vis money in relation to sophistry and psychoanalysis. Yes, you you are just here playing in Greek between singular and plural. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, reason, the reason you you ask, hmm, it will be a plural logoi. Mm -hmm. And the reason you 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 generalize is is logos, mm -hmm. just as discourse yeah. you see, mm -hmm. and uh, well, uh, this is uh, an entire uh, exploration that is needed to not to say, you know, uh, very very problematic yeah, yeah, things, yeah, yeah. because uh, you know maybe that the first psychoanalyst was a sophist, Antiphon, mm -hmm. who um, uh, opened a, a cabinet on the Agora uh, cabinet of psychoanalysis. He made a plaque. What is a plaque? Um, you know, um, a plaque? Yeah, yeah a yeah. plaque. Uh, saying, um, uh, ca cabinet, hmm? um, to, uh, um, how do you say that? Uh, techne alupias. That means know how to um, put away the mourn, the difficulties, mm -hmm. the, the chagrin. Mm -hmm. What do you say, chagrin? Sadness. 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 It's, it, it was, yes, it's, it was, an, a, 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 and this was so written, like you know, extraordinary. Yeah. This yeah. was written, and then he received people, I don't know if they were alive, but maybe, and he received people, and he said, your dreams. Tell your dreams. So people tell on dreams, and then he interprets. Mm -hmm. 
And this was the first Techne Alupias, mm -hmm. the first psychoanalyst cabinet in Corinth at uh, uh, fifth before Christ. And we all have the, we, we have all the testimonies about that. No, four before Christ. Um, so c can you just say a little bit more about why you think it's a mistake, uh, uh, how um, Logos, um, it's a mistake to simply kind of straightforwardly kind of think, to translate it as reason or rationality, um, and the link between reason and rhetoric. Uh, can you just maybe just elaborate a bit? Uh, yes, well, I, I, it's, it's, when I say it's a mistake, it's because I am a sophist um, <laughs> this time. Because it's a mistake, because it, it means more than that. Other things at the same time, it means what you have translated as discourse. Absolutely, it's clear. And what you have translated as reason. Mm -hmm. So it means this uh, mixed, hmm, or this co-naturality between what will be called discourse and what will be called reason. Mm -hmm. That's the, the point. But logos, you know, all know what it means exactly. Uh, the first etymology is A under B equal C under D. That's a proportion. That's an analogy of proportion. So this is, you can, you can of course, understand why it could mean at, why it could mean at the same time reason and discourse. Mm -hmm. hmm? It's every relationship that you that you relationship between relationships order to uh, relation of order to mm -hmm. so this is a discourse and this is reason this mm -hmm. is the way you described it also hmm? mm -hmm. so that's mm -hmm. the point well maybe this would be a good point to transition to the second the second question of the relation of um, of Ray's account of discursive rationality to um, to sophistry I mean so Ray I mean I guess the, the, maybe you could begin by just saying a little bit about uh, you know, what you might have said about that question if, if there were more time to, to directly address it or what sort of um, comes to mind in terms of uh, Brandom's inferentialism vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis sophistry. Well, um, okay, I guess, I mean, the distinction he establishes between um, you know, to, um, I guess, sophistry is any kind of uh, use of deployment of assertion or kind of, you know, uh, series of assertions um, which knowingly uh, is designed to kind of to convince and persuade by, in a way, kind of by uh, you know, manipulating the, uh, I guess, the, the beliefs or the kind of um, the affects of the hearer, um, such that they feel, you know, to kind of to, to, to compel acceptance or um, uh, uh, there's another word that's more fitting. Um, well, let's just say acceptance, okay? Um, and which doesn't recognize, um, which is based on authority in the sense of like. Um, Power of persuasion. Okay, so the, the, the authority that the sophist has is uh, a persuasiveness. And a persuasiveness just means the ability um, to convince you that something is um, compelling, something that something that commands assent without you really, um, you know, in a in a way which involves kind of you know not uh, distinguishing or not. You know, kind of not recognizing something like reason or um, the authority of a reason. Um, so I guess that that would be the, the straightforward. Uh, so in other words, it's it's kind of a rhetorical force or power, as opposed to something that you can, an authority that you can, uh, you know, the authority of a reason, which you can, you know, independently kind of uh, uh, recognize or consent to. Um, now, okay, so, and I guess this goes back to this issue about kind of, uh, of, of authority. Is there, 
is it possible, or is it legitimate and illegitimate authority? Um, okay, so Branham's whole account is predicated on this, you know, uh, the viability of this distinction. That there's a legitimate kind of authority which does not involve subordination to force, okay? So to something like force, because force is without reason. Force is just the way it is. So in other words, when you're compelled by force, you're just compelled to do something without being able to, um, I guess, to kind of, uh, to adjudicate for yourself um, why this thing is as it is. Um, but this, I mean, so, but this is a very conventional, so what I'm saying is that's a fairly kind of standard interpretation of sophistry. Um, but I guess the contrast, of course, the contrast between uh, reason and force or um, justification and persuasion is internal to, to rationality in random sense. Okay, so it can only be recognized from someone who kind of accepts this uh, and in other words, so the sophist will be he who denies that there's a real difference between justification and persuasion. Okay. The sophist denies that there's a real difference. He says all justification is really just a kind of persuasive, kind of you know, rhetorical persuasiveness, skill in manipulating the beliefs of your interlocutor. Um, so, now the, so the problem is that there's an asymmetry between uh, the philosopher and the sophist in that, you know, um, the philosopher is in a position of having to try to, well, it's okay. If the philosopher has to convince the interlocutor, the sophist, that there is a real difference between uh, justification and persuasion, um, he has to do so without, in a way which doesn't, is not itself an imposition, just a kind of a rhetorical trick or, or maneuver. Um, and the sophist will always try to reduce, you know, to kind of, uh, in a way to, to re- um, Reinstantiate a symmetry, okay? Your reasons are really just, um, you know, your reason is just rhetoric. Uh, the authority of, of reason that you, you know, the, the authority of justification that you keep on deploying is actually nothing more than forcefulness, you know, forcefulness or power of, of, of in some sense. So this is why there's a kind of um, this is why you can't. Uh, I guess there is no non... I mean, the problem is that you can't cause reasons. You can't derive reasons from causes. Okay? So there is no natural account. For, for anyone who, who refuses to kind of acknowledge this distinction, you will never be able to um, convince someone... Um, to convince someone that there is a kind of... Uh, that certain combinations of, of words, combinations of assertions, can um, uh, differ in this kind of fundamental regard in that they involve, you know, uh, a justification. So, so and, and then the platonic move, as I understand it, in the, in the sophist is to say, is to say, precisely, the sophist has, is kind of, denies the equivocity of being, says that being is what it is, you know, and in other words, there is no um, assertion is just asserting what is, so that there's this kind of translative, this kind of um, co-extensiveness of logos, of discourse, and being, okay? Uh, the being of speech is guaranteed by its practical efficacy. Because words can do things, mm -hmm. that's why, that, that guarantees the kind of their ontological purchase, their ontological valence. And he denies that there's anything. He denies that there's anything lacking. Okay, so Plato, I mean, or the, rather the Eleatic Stranger suggests no. Um, we can only begin to distinguish between, uh, you know, causes and reasons, or force. You know, the kind of uh, the forcefulness, the authority of power, and the authority of justification, by denying this perfect, uh, this coextensiveness of logos and being by saying that sometimes in order to mean what you say you have to you have to kind of express what is not okay and in order 
you know, and that what you mean is not. And in order for you, um, and in order for you to deny, in order for you to kind of say that that's false, you have to acknowledge that um, it's possible for what is not to somehow be. So in other words, you suspend the Parmenidean kind of prohibition um, on uttering or expressing that which is not. Um, so in other words, the sophists will always say, you cannot, um, there's nothing to deny. There's nothing to deny in denying justification because justification is itself just um, something, um, it's just a kind of a, another kind of linguistic or rhetorical maneuver. So as I understand it, the Iliatic stranger, or Plato rather, in, in this, is suggesting that the, uh, the first, the only thing that can compel the recognition of this asymmetry between reasons and causes is the recognition that the, the sophist, the practice of the sophist, involves a denial mm -hmm. that he cannot, that he kind of you know, presupposes, but that he cannot express. So in other words, the efficacy of his, um, the efficacy of his assertion presupposes a negation that he has to kind of cover over or kind of uh, or foreclose in a way, like if I guess in one sense. So this is why I think like um, this is why I think there's a. I mean, I think that you know the link between kind of reason and negativity, reason and negation, is goes back to to the soft to Plato and the sophists mm -hmm. and the, the idea that kind of being and non-being are mixed together, um, and this mixture is the con you know I don't know the, the condition of rational kind of uh, justification. That's this kind of platonic insight I think that Hegel kind of you know runs with and converts. just just very briefly. Yeah. Then, I mean it's it's interesting I think in relation to the the passage that that Barbara quoted in her paper about how one can imitate the philosopher but one can't imitate eloquence. Because it not be, you can't imitate eloquence because it's, there's an imminence mm. of the relation between logos and discourse. But the negation of that imminence opens up the space in where there can be imitation. But yeah. that's precisely on the side of philosophical rationality in your account. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, I, want, I wanted to just think more about this, uh, this very interesting. Um, a distinction, or, or, or this apparent necessity to distinguish between authority and power in order to maintain the distinction between philosophy and sophistry. Because, of course, the, I mean, the authority power, or rather, I mean, again, this is also a linguistic question, authority force or authority violence distinction. I mean, uh, Hannah Arendt has this uh, um, pretty famous essay called What is Authority, which hinges entirely on this question, as does her text uh, on violence. Now, um, leaving aside for the moment the conditions of translatability of a, of a term which, let's say, genealogically speaking, has a, both theological and political origins, or distinctions that have theological and political origins, I'm actually curious about the possible discontinuity uh, between, broadly speaking, I mean, and this is a very... Uh, a very impoverished use of these names, but you know Plato and Hegel, mm -hmm. because as far as I can make out, in terms of a, a thinking in Hegel, in which actually it is very uh, 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 difficult, if not impossible, to separate out the domains of linguistic, political, social, and other forms of normativity. I don't know if the distinction between authority and uh, uh, power or authority and force really makes sense for Hegel, who's far too canny and cynical and fundamentally realist a thinker, uh, perhaps post Machiavellian a thinker in matters political, to really think in the way that Kant does that you can actually, because I think this is the sense in which, you know, for instance, Arendt is a Kantian rather than a Hegelian thinker because she does actually think that you can think politics in the diremption of authority and power, that you can, you know, that you can suspend uh, 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 this uh, like very messy admixture that is gewalt, which is you know, like, you know, power and violence. And so, and interestingly enough, the same term that Heidegger uses in that rather obnoxious passage about Greek and German. Um, 
so the power and you know the depth and give out of a of a, of a people. Uh, so I was I was one, really wondering about that question. So uh, not 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 necessarily in terms of the social and political thinking of Hegel. You know. I think you know I think it's fairly obvious that in the philosophy of right you couldn't really separate authority and a power that also involves force, but also what the repercussions of that may be in terms of discussions about normativity at a more linguistic level. And I guess one thing that might be interesting to develop also, and we haven't really talked about it, even though the name of Badiou has surfaced here and there, but which I'd like to know what people's thoughts are, especially because we've also brought up Lacan on a number of occasions, is the is the triadic relationship between philosophy, sophistry, and anti-philosophy. And, 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 and there is this constant, you know, it's very peculiar in Badiou that the same figures, uh, in some cases, well, at least in the cases of Lacan, Nietzsche, and Wittgenstein, are either in the same or indeed in different phases of their thinking, identified as sophists or anti-philosophers who seem to have different roles vis-a-vis uh, -vis philosophy's self-conception and self-development. So the challenge that the sophist poses to the philosopher is different than uh, uh, the challenge that the anti-philosopher poses. Because so, the anti-philosopher is posing, uh, um, is really proposing a form of existence, and in fact for Badiou, an act whose horizon is the destruction of philosophy. I mean, he says this very explicitly with regards to Nietzsche. You know, he says, you know, the anti-philosopher's role is to announce and produce an act without precedent, an act that will in fact destroy philosophy. Whilst, of course, the sophist philosopher relationship is much more, in many ways, com possibly complicitous or, or dialectical, if you will. Or, so I was curious about that. I mean, he obviously does that with, with, with Wittgenstein, where the, the Tractatus is the anti-philosophical text and the philosophical investigations is a sophistical one. So I'm just, I'm curious about whether this third figure of the anti-philosopher might, you know, which is a kind of, you know, and I think the anti-philosopher is like a sophist, it's like a mystical sophist, you know, or a, 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 a decisionist sophist, or, a, you know, or a, in, in Badiou's formulation, which is, which is why it's so slippery, because they, the figures keep going in and out of these, Yes. Um, do you think it depends of the figure, or do you think it depends of the use that you makes of it? Ah, okay. <laughs> yes. You think the latter? Yes. Yes, okay. Of course. So that it's an intra-philosophical figure, so the anti-philosophers only exist. They are all bad use figure. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> that, I don't think that's necessarily uh, that contentious, but... No. Uh, in any case, that was just a kind of point of... Curiosity. Um, the authority power thing, um, I think it's more complicated. So obviously Hegel complicates a straightforward kind of uh, Kantian, you know, the kind of, well, the, the Kantian dualism of, you know, the normative and the causal, okay? So like power is just a causal force, causal efficacy. Authority is like, you know, um, normative in some, whatever that might mean, okay? Um, so obviously he, and, you know, I think. What I take Brandon to be trying to kind of uh, reconstruct is how, of course, authority is a kind of power. Mm -hmm. okay? Authority is a kind of power, and it's not this kind of it's not this kind of supplementary force, this kind of supernatural agency. Um, it involves, you know, the exercise of authority is always the exercise of a kind of power or potency, which is practically and materially kind of you know, uh, inst you know, instantiated. Um, does that then therefore means that the kind of distinction is kind of just a mystification? Does that mean that really all authority is really power? Well, oh, but that's not the yeah, point I okay. wanted to make. Okay. I mean, the point that I wanted to make is really more that that Hegel's very rich conception of what normativity means, both socially but also as you know, linguistic or in social practice, broadly speaking also involves, including within it, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, moments uh, that can't be um, exhausted by um, 
the norm by the normativity that seems to have that, that has been translated from Hegel in his own language by Brandom. So take an obvious example. You cannot have a state for Hegel without the rule of the idiot monarch. The idiot monarch is key. Like you can't that's not like you can't get rid of that. So and that's I think quite curious the the presence, the internalization within this very rich conception of both rationality and authority and power, and also of truth, we could say by, by extension, of uh, uh, moments that other thinkers, you know, including Kant, you could say, and others, would see as ones that, that, that an enlightened form of both politics and rationality would need to expunge. You could say, you can make yes. a not dissimilar argument about the role of war in Hegel. Yeah. And what I find, what I think is curious, I guess this is, I suppose, the, the uh, a broader question about the, the extensive transcoding or translatability, I suppose is whether, what happens if one tries to subtract those moments? So this you already alluded to in your discussion or in your, in your mention of, of, of Honneth, one of the things that makes Honneth, at least to me, deeply problematic as well as, you know, very dull, is the, the attempt to think that you can't actually reconstruct the philosophy of right without these moments. Mm -hmm. But then what results um, is in the guise of a fully self-consistent reason, actually less rational. Because that's, in a sense, I guess that's what I mean by, by Hegel's realism. I mean, Hegel realizes that the authority, I mean, he wants to, he wants to control and limit and domesticate the violence. So the monarch really doesn't do anything except be an idiot who signs the decisions. But there has to be an idiot who signs the decisions and not popular rule and not uh, enlightened communication or whatever. Mm -hmm. Just. So that's, I guess that's what I'm, I'm kind of curious about, like the possibility of subtracting those moments, which I'm thinking about in political terms just because that's the side of Hegel I'm more mm -hmm. familiar with, but which I imagine might have their counterparts in how we understand signification, Activity, language, and so on. Okay, I mean, I guess it's a difficult question, well, for me to answer right now, because it depends on how you understand, for instance, how this distinction is articulated in terms of like the, unf the phenomenology, the unfolding of these kind of shapes of spirit. Um, so obviously, like Hegel, and you know, the example of the of the king. I mean, Zizek keeps using this example about the absurdity. Um, so I mean, he, so it's clear that. So the kind of the articulation of authority and power, so in a way that there's a moment of absurdity, which can have play a legitimating role. Okay, play a legitimating role. Does that mean that? Um, so, the, but the question is, I think it's a mistake to think that uh, the recognition, which a Cotton Branham's reconstruction is supposed to be, kind of constitutive of, um, you know, when you. Of you know this kind of idea, this optimum moment when you recognize that uh, you know something only has, you know you can, you can only be responsible to something, insofar as you partly constitute its independence, but also like you know you realize that you know there's so there's a kind of dialectical reciprocity. Now does, but it's not that reciprocity is not explicitly self-conscious. It's it's not articulated in any kind of individual conscious consciousness. It can be going on behind the back of uh, subjects, okay, and it can be going on behind the back of an entire kind of, uh, you know, a, a shape of spirit, a shape of spirit, a community, so to speak. So the question is, does he think at what points? I mean, I guess what is controversial about Branham's account is that he clearly he wants to be very clear. You know, he credits Hegel. He said, you know, this account is, you know. And Nathan, I know you, you took exception to this, the claim that um, what, what happens is that modernity, Hegel is the philosopher of modernity, modernity is the only thing that has ever happened in the entire of human history, it's the only <laughs> significant event in human history, precisely because it involves this uh, change, this kind of uh, dialectical explicitation uh, and the kind of the, uh, the full expression of this, of the reciprocity between dependence and independence. Um, now, if you if you adopt a less kind of sanguine, I guess more realist or more materialist account of Hegel, you can say, well, this can be. Um, it's a mistake to think that you can ever have this. Uh, that, that there's a kind of a constitutive 
you know, absurdity or uh, an unacknowledged um, independence or a kind of a non-rational authority that is itself the condition for this for the kind of the, 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 for this reciprocity. Okay, so that and now that involves now I'm not I'm ill equipped to answer that question right now because you know it, I just you know I've been foraging in the phenomenology like you know recently so so that's a real that's that's a real question. Um, but um, okay, but then the, the kind of the, the relationship. But then you can't just say, you know, if you simply say that well, power is a, if you establish a straightforward convertibility between power and authority, then you would ontologize it in a way which is kind of problematic. And you say that authority is there in the world, which you know, there's lots of evidence to believe that you know Hegel he doesn't think that you know he's not. I mean, no, it's not an ontology of force. It's not an it's ontology not of, of force. Um, so that's, and then the, the anti-philosopher question, uh, and the distinction between the, the sophist and the anti-philosopher. Yes, I think it's clear that the anti-philosopher is, um, well, yeah, I mean, what is bad use? He says that the anti-philosopher is, uh, I mean, wants a subjectivized kind of truth in some way, in some importance, in, in, in some he sense. He wants to be truth. He wants to be truth, sense. exactly. He wants us. I mean, like Nietzsche and... Mm -hmm. like Hence Nietzsche the role of the act. Of so the act, the act would yes. be this, yeah. Pascal. this fusion Pascal, yes. of, you know, fusion of being and truth, but in, in the figure. I mean, yes. that's why it's a dramatic and personal figure. That's yes. why it's... Um, whereas yeah. the sophist presumably is not... So it's a question of, like, subjectivation or subjectivity. Like, the sophist, perhaps... Um, I mean, anti-philosophy yeah. is not a social practice in the way that, yes. I mean, it's not a, yes, exactly. it's not a game. Yes. <laughs> or, yes. or, uh, yeah, basically, yeah. I mean, um, not, not in the same sense. But, and I, I guess the anti, yes, so I guess there's a, well, yes, there's a complicity between the philosopher and the anti-philosopher, which is maybe not there in the relationship between the philosopher and the sophist, precisely because the anti-philosopher is wholly kind of invested, thinks that there's a truth you know, a truth which cannot be articulated by the logos. There's a something I don't know, an ineffable, a truth beyond language, a truth basically. beyond language, an absolute transcendence, an absolute you know, something that is incommunicable, but ne but uh, but not but not simply absurd. <coughs> um. May I ask you a question? Does Brandon speak somewhere of sophists? Because Hegel does. And does Brandon uh, speak of uh, what Hegel say about sophists? Um, because it's very interesting. He, no, I haven't come across it. I haven't read the whole of his, the manuscript of his Hegel book. Um, so I don't know. I honestly don't know. Not in the bits, in the bits I've read, yeah. but you know, I haven't read all of it. So he doesn't actually uh, say anything about sophists. Because no. uh, Hegel, in his, in his history of philosophy, um, has a long chapter, maybe the most uh, uh, elogious I've ever read uh, in, uh, in a philosopher's mouth <laughs> or mm -hmm. pen, you know, about sophists. And he's, he begins by uh, saying that uh, sophists are the masters of Greece in the two meanings, uh, educational master, masters in paideia, mm -hmm. and political masters. So. And, it, and then the next sentence is, and they are both because they are master in Logos. So um, I wonder uh, if you uh, tr working about uh, sophists and, and uh, in, in a way uh, Hegel, you met this kind of sentence. No, I was, um, I was unfamiliar with it, no. Oh. Open it up to the floor. Yeah, you have a... Uh, I'm yep. sure people here have questions. Of course, yeah. I mean, we can, and maybe we can. <laughs> so maybe we can, yeah, let's take some questions and we can maybe wrap up with this third question that I raised at the beginning, or we can just leave it. But yeah, please. This is a history of philosophy question. Yeah. No, the, the, the function of philosophy question. I have uh, three, um, three moments um, of uh, my three associations. Uh, first, um, like in this relation of uh, philosophy, uh, philosopher and money, thing which came to my mind is this quotation from the first edition of the first, um, for the first volume of uh, Capital, where uh, Marx is saying, 
Marx has given this example uh, of uh, money, this metaphor of money as an animal as such. So he's uh, saying as if, uh, it is as if um, uh, in addition and uh, alongside and external to the really existing uh, rabbits and uh, tigers and whatever giraffes, uh, there was an animal as such who uh, in uh, uh, there was an animal as such uh, who is the uh, embodiment uh, of an entire animal kingdom. And uh, this is for Marx the, the universal uh, equivalent. Um, at some uh, at some place, uh, Zizek comments on uh, this in this huge volume, less than nothing. Uh, he comments on this um, quotation, uh, but in relation to uh, to the other uh, to the difference between human and animal. So he is saying the human being itself is like this um, is like this money. So it, it, this is a kind of um, uh, universal uh, again universal or the. Um, the abstract universal, so which produces this minimal difference uh, between animal and human, whatever. Uh, and uh, uh, like philosopher, as uh, I would say, as a kind of like concentration of this idea of the human, uh, might be uh, might be kind of this universal uh, equivalent, uh, like a human being as such, like the the indeterminate, uh, what Alex yesterday was talking about artists, like artists uh, as not having a certain agenda, then a philosopher is kind of like a person who does not have a certain uh, uh, vocation or uh, like um, mm -hmm. uh, a certain uh, determinacy um, as uh, the rest of the, uh, the uh, spiritual, let's say, animal kingdom in Marxist terms. Someone is rabbit, someone is... Uh, um, a giraffe and only the philosopher is the, the animal as such. To continue about the animals, uh, I just, so uh, like this, uh, this um, uh, equivalent, so I cannot stop thinking about plastic again, uh, that uh, like as if money uh, stop, uh, uh, if, uh, let's say, if money stop to be uh, a universal equivalent, we can get another one, like plastic can be universal equivalent um, when, when we will have like plastic models of all things in the world. And uh, this, this human being, um, again to this idea, it's also Heideggerian idea that animals do not count, uh, only human beings count and, and therefore animals do not, money, do not know money and so, so on and so forth. So um, uh, uh, this human being uh, or philosopher pretends to be this um, uh, creature is such who gives account on all things, all different various kinds of things of the world. Um, then um, to continue about animals, um, like I, I like this quotation. I, I just wanted to, uh, to ask again from whom because I didn't. Uh, Zorretto. It's an intellectual and manual labor. It's in the. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's in the book. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. So uh, animals uh, do not know uh, money, and this was my uh, like crazy idea that. Um, there is a something, uh, there is a linkage between communism and animality. Animals are communists, actually. <laughs> communism starts from the dog who, at a certain point, refuses to pay for her bloody piece of meat. Uh, but um, this, um, this, um, <laughs> this relation goes deeper, actually, because uh, when we say animals do not know money, um, uh, let me give you an example of a donkey, for example. Donkey does not know money, therefore, uh, we are not obliged to pay for his uh, labor. And uh, sometimes, like slaves in Greece, they also do not know money. They, therefore, uh, and a certain uh, categories of people as well. Yeah, we, we will as well. And then my, my next, um, then my last point, basically. Um, coming back to, uh, to uh, from what Barbara started, uh, to this idea of uh, um, to this scene uh, of uh, Thales and uh, the maid, uh, which Mladen um, Dolar, I just wanted to bring his spirit of the <laughs> Dolar in, in this room. Um, he dedicated a paper to this scene, uh, and uh, he says that it's actually the primordial, the uh, inaugurating scene of all philosophy, mm -hmm. this relation 
which marks the difference, which is not only, so which is both, uh, both a sexual difference between the mm -hmm. male and the female, and also a class difference mm -hmm. between the maid, the maid, the servant, and the, uh, the first capitalist, basically, mm -hmm. um, and, um, and etc., etc., other kinds of differences, like the barbaric and the noble, uh, the, uh, the Greek. The, the Greek, yes. Um, uh, so, and in this paradigmatic sen, uh, uh, scene uh, goes on and on. Uh, and if we talk about anti-philosopher, so I was thinking about anti-philosopher and uh, was trying to apply this Badusian uh, concept also to Bataille, which works perfectly because he's like anti-philosopher um, in front of Hegel par excellence. Uh, and uh, in one of his papers, uh, Bruno Bastille's uh, uh, trying to make a, the category, uh, categorization of, of um, um, uh, like different, uh, to point different characteristics of uh, anti-philosophers and uh, one of them is this performativity or uh, spectacle and uh, I would say in, in like Bataille uh, case it's almost a hysterical spectacle, uh, spectacle and uh, he's, uh, um, he's always talking about uh, laughter, laughter uh, and uh, it's like um, his initial gesture so uh, as if anti-philosopher was the philosopher who pretends at the same time, who pretends to occupy structurally this position of, of, um, of the maid, so of not of the master. So that this position of a hysterical provocation uh, of the master. Democritus, uh, love, and yet he's always laughing. Yeah, but I would say, for example, Hegel is is too serious. He mm -hmm. doesn't laugh at mm -hmm. all. Who? Or Hegel, for for Bataille. I mean, yes, for yes. Bataille. Yes, like, yes. Um, I, I, I don't agree, probably. Or Heidegger, let's say. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Uh, yeah. So it's uh, like kind of um, in um, uh, so in defense of this the, the, the poor, the, the the woman, the animal, and so on. Uh, something like this. I could, I could say some, I can say something about this. I think that this point about uh, the generic um, position of the philosopher is interesting because it's not that the philosopher is one who has, um, like the artist maybe who doesn't have, who supposedly doesn't have an agenda, but it's, it's uh, but I don't know that it's, it's true sometimes maybe and sometimes it's not true. So that um, I would say that uh, Plato, for example, is, um, he does think that there's a vocation, let's say, of philosophy, which is to, which is, it's, it's constitutively related to the good, for example. And this is interesting because it's something that recurs throughout the history of philosophy as a kind of maybe internal distinction in the history of philosophy. So for, for Deleuze, um, Kant and Hegel mm -hmm. remain kind of state philosophers because they do uphold whatever protestations, a certain kind of, um, uh, morality, um, which is not the morality necessarily of common sense, but it's, it's related in this sort of almost, for Deleuze, a kind of banal way to the good. And that's the whole point of the theory of the image of thought in Deleuze, that, um, that to think uh, without presuppositions, unlike Kant or Hegel in this way, that, they're, that they retain this sort of the goodness of the philosopher, right? Um, that the philosopher is one who battles stupidity, but in order to do so, the philosopher has to be stupid. That is to say, like exactly in a different register, occupy the Socratic position of knowing that one doesn't know, or even not knowing that one doesn't know. And then it's possible to have an encounter which, with something in the world which makes one think. So that there in Deleuze, you do get this desire for the philosophical subject, if you will, to be this purely generic, um, not mind, but uh, capacity for an empirical encounter which will make thinking happen. But I think that it's, uh, it's interesting to think about in relation to, to Plato, because there, the, the Deleuze, okay, you know, he wants to uh, 
overturn Platonism from with, as a radicalization of certain elements of Platonism. And of course, there are times at which he wants to render the philosopher and the sophist indistinct, but there are other ways in which he clearly doesn't affirm the kind of position of the sophist either. Um, but uh, but this, I, I think this question of whether, so for, so for Deleuze, you know, and it is not polemical, but Brandom, I think, would be a kind of state philosopher in this mm -hmm. mold as well of, of Kant and Hegel, and I'm sure he would, in fact, affirm such a mm -hmm. thing. Um, and uh, so this, I think, is, is an internal distinction in philosophy and maybe not between the philosopher and the sophist. Mm -hmm. But then, um, I mean, you might want to say something about what Oksana just said, just to follow on this, just yeah. because it's fresh in mind. I mean, one of the curious um, sources, I suppose, or maybe uh, conceptual reasons why Badiou formulates the idea of the anti-philosophers in that way is precisely because there is no philosophical subject, which is a very yeah. curious... I mean, when, when Ray and I wrote, uh, mm -hmm. whatever it was, like a, 10 years ago, that uh, introduction to the theoretical writings, that, you know, that was one of the things that we both, I think, found very interesting that in, in, in Badiou, the, the philosophy is itself subtracted from this yeah. practice of subjectivation. I mean, even though on, on some level, you know, there, there's all sorts of, so to speak, performative contradictions in Badiou's uh, um, uh, idea that there's no subject uh, of philosophy, because at times it gives the appearance that at least the, the philosopher is a kind of meta-subject or, you know, uh, perhaps the you know, the subject next to all the other ones who's the real subject or whatever. But I think that's interesting because then the, the anti-philosopher is the one that, in a sense, you could say wants to destroy philosophy, but his, his form of destroying philosophy is to, uh, uh, to break this kind of prohibition and try to turn thinking itself as such, not thinking as a particular practice within a generic procedure, scientific, artistic, political, uh, erotic, or what have you, into itself the vector of subjectivation, which is this kind of psychotic disaster, in yeah. a sense, yeah. for, for Badiou. And I think that that's, you know, that's a, a kind of curious, um, yeah, a sort of curious facet mm -hmm. of that, uh, I think that discussion. So the, so the, so the anti-philosopher is, in a sense, um, you know, while the, while the sophist I mean, viewed from the standpoint, the instrumental standpoint, and I think Barbara is right, these are figures internal to Badiou that have, that play uh, a, a support, they're the supporting cast, mm -hmm. so to speak, of the philosopher, but the, 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 the sophist provides this kind of, uh, um, uh, provides this constant test of the, of the solidity, but also the suppleness of the philosophical arguments, whilst in a sense the the, uh, you know, the anti-philosopher is like a warning, <laughs> you know. The anti-philosopher is this kind of like catatonic, drooling Nietzsche figure at the end. Like this is, this is what happens if you, if you don't, if you don't uh, keep, uh, you know, the various uh, uh, sort of taboos in place about suturing and so on and so forth. Or at least that's, you know, that seems part of the case. Unless the anti-philosopher takes a more religious caste, and then that anti-philosopher has their own practice, and it's a practice that's sustainable, and that's a difficult point for Badiou, because then it would just be an alternative. Uh, just, just on a side, I mean, I think it's extremely interesting, because in a way, like, the fact, I mean, there's a kind of two a kind of different conceptions of impersonality, like, in a way, the problem, like, the Deleuzean philosopher ends up having a kind of, or like, the anti-philosopher wants to have a kind of a personal relationship to the impersonal. Um, in even in a, in a kind of Bergson and Deleuze, you've got philosophy. You know the the uh, in through the encounter, you get this kind of desubjectivation. In, but in which you you, op you open up to the impersonal, you and your own you know kind of the uh, the boundaries of your own experience become porous, and then you start experiencing this subrepresentational realm. And in a way, I find bad, bad use kind of a, it's very interesting this prohibition that bad use has. That um, it's a you know something like a, you know, an impersonal personality, the, sub, the philosopher, and the fact that philosophy is conditioning by you know, extra philosophical truths means that the philosophical operation remains strictly. You, you can't personalize it. There's a kind of the way in which you learn the practice of philosophy, the way in which you, you kind of have to kind of 
start discriminating the truth conditions, the conditions for philosophizing involves, I mean, he doesn't say very much about this, well, except when he talks about kind of creating a space of, for the compossibilization of kind of truths. But um, it's interesting because it seems to be a very, there's a kind of a thesis or there's a kind of, I mean, he never uses the word social, okay? But you doesn't, in a way, the problem in Deleuze is that the impersonal is never social. And uh, although Badiou doesn't talk about, I think what's interesting in, in Hegelian philosophy is the link between, you know, impersonality and the, the, you know, so, and sociality and the and the the link between socialization and subjectivation. And I think although Badiou doesn't have a kind of a straight doesn't establish this link between socialization and subjectivation, there's a kind of a in a way the kind of the way in which the philosopher creates, carves out a kind of a space for the composibilization of these truths is a kind of an, an interesting intervention in, I don't know, in a, in a, in a social or cultural kind of domain. Um, well, that's what happens in a sense in the preface to The Logics of Worlds where he, he sort of avows the fact that supporting this is a kind of explicitly ideological conflict. In fact, an ideological conflict, interesting, that the whole distinction between democratic materialism, which is basically soft, I mean, again, like in, it's like sophistry in politics for him, mm -hmm. uh, and the materialist dialectic, is actually a conflict at a level which is not reducible to, the question, to questions of truth. I mean, it is a, um, yeah. it is the choice of the frame. So mm -hmm. therefore, in that sense, it's ideological, not in the, in the diminishing sense, but in the sense of a, of a prior attitude towards what it is to think uh, yeah. Barbara, I think you were going to interject yes. a moment ago. Uh, a moment ago, yes, it was about, I, I wanted how to qualify, you know, in this frame of uh, um, anti-philosophy, sophistic, etc., the way Badiou um, replaces the idea of good by the idea of truth in uh, his translation of Republic. Mm -hmm. This is absolutely, well, it's a meta or ultra, ultra translation. Uh -huh. Is it ultra philosophy? <laughs> <laughs> Hyper philosophy. Hyper philosophy? <laughs> Did you have any other comments about Because I'm quite curious from somebody who writes about not just Greek philosophy, but also translation and language. Sorry? If you had more comments about that, uh, <laughs> I'm just curious. This is a total, total aside, but. Can I have a question? Uh, I mean, if there are no I think Aaron. I think Aaron has a minute. But one, one, just one quick remark about this. Does he really translate? Um, yeah. The good yeah. as the truth. Yeah. Yeah. That's very curious. And because of course he doesn't think that you know, there's anything like he, the truth. He, he did. Also translates he the did many, many, many changes. But <laughs> the yeah. point is the only. I, I always agree with those changes that uh, that are not changes. Well, I mean, if he invent a girl or if he invent uh -huh. uh, you know scenery yeah. or pictures uh, in the cavern, uh, it's perfectly okay for me. But the point where, where we really disagree uh -huh. is when he replaced something that Plato said sure. by something he says. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's a hyper-Platonism. So, uh, my question goes back a little bit to the debate last night and is directed mostly to Barbara Cassin. And um, in your book, there's this wonderful quote that I think Nathan uh, brought up by Maxim, uh, Maximilian, uh, Quintiliano, sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, this uh, Philosophia in Im Simulari Potest, Eloquentia Non Potest, which is, uh, I think, you know, if you have to boil it down, I think this is really the sentence. I think if I were an uh, analytic philosopher and truly, you know, read this, I would stop being an analytic philosopher. <laughs> um, because it's just true. So, yeah, I, I love it. Um, but my question is this. I, I completely buy this argument by, by Quintilianus. And I do think that, you know, uh, its basic premise of... Uh, ontology being logology, if I use the terms that you used, uh, you know, which, which can stretch to people like Heidegger who would say that being dwells in language or you know, vice versa, that uh, language is the house of being or whatever. Uh, basically it goes to the idea that being is produced in language. I, I, 
I think this really goes to many, many, you know, uh, practices like psycho psychoanalytic practice pretty much uh, start, you know, dwells uh, in this idea that something is produced in speech, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but then my question goes back to, to last night, to, to the question of less and more, because I cannot possibly imagine to accept this argument of less and more. Of, of what? Of less, less and more. Oh, and yes, more. yes, yes. Sorry. I, 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 I heard, I know you know what? A, I, I heard this was a... Listen more. <laughs> listen more. Okay. Interesting. There's <laughs> <laughs> a uh, like, uh, Yes, <laughs> listen more. Okay, interesting. Yes, so, yes, yes. Um, less and more. I, I don't think... Is it, would you say, this is my question, would you say that there is... You know, if you accept that uh, Quintiliani's statement it follows that you also have to accept this argument of less and more. Is there, you know, or is this just two completely different arguments? Because on some level, last, last night you argued that this is sophistical, um, no. I mean, this is what a, a sophist would do, argue for less and more instead of arguing for things like infinite evil or something like that. Hmm. I'm not sure. I, I hope my question makes sense. Um, yes, it does. Can I can I still be a sophist uh, yes. while uh, while not accepting less yes, and more? Exactly. This is my question. Oh yes, certainly. Um, the point is is to, to know when you accept something, and what for, and uh, instead of what you know. So um, when when I was speaking of less and more, it was uh, to um, contradict the superlative and it was to contradict the idea that truth is an absolute that's all and it could be very delusion as an idea you know um, I don't remember the, the exact sentence of Deleuze saying uh, utility is um, uh, has to be uh, truth has to be replaced has to be replaced by utility it's not the real uh, sentence uh, not because um, um, utility is not because true has uh, no um, mm, I'm sorry uh, bec because utility measures the truth I, I say you see? not because true is not true is not truth but because uh, something measures the, the truthly of the truth hmm? The truth level. So that's just the point. Against what are you speaking? If I if I speak, I won't speak of more and less like that. You know, I speak of more or, or uh, uh, and less only if you tell me. And that's why sophistication is a second discourse. Hmm? Uh, if you tell me that truth is there is one truth, the truth with a T majuscule, capital T, and that uh, this. Truth is a superlative thing. Then I said, no, no, let, let, let me see. There can be things truer than others, etc. And then we begin to discuss. That's all, you know. So you can believe um, in Cantillon without believing in this dedicated comparative. Mm -hmm. Can I be a little more specific, or should we go? Um, okay. If I'll, okay. <laughs> I could be more specific. Yeah. I, you know, I always have a very. Um, I just want to go back to the to the money question, and, and I have a simple. I, I I was also thinking like maybe I'm just amplifying Oksana's question, but I was also thinking I really like that formulation of Alex that the, the artist has no agenda, and I was thinking you know one of the most striking um, descriptions of philosophers of like Socrates is he's atopos, you know he doesn't have a place, and that's also why he can't be paid. Yeah. In a way, like art is also, also. I mean, honestly, it's strange to pay for a work of art. I mean, I think we forget this because it's so normal, but that's a weird thing to buy a work of art. And it's a weird thing to pay a philosopher. And the idea is that simply certain things fall outside of exchange. And I think even if we think of this in a very common sense way, like without, you know, there's probably certain things of your life you would exchange and certain things that just don't have a price. If everything could be exchanged, somehow your life would really lose its meaning. And in a weird way, that's very individual. OK, I, I, I think we, I don't know, I don't think that's such a crazy claim. You could probably recognize that. 
And like I think philosophy, there are certain social practices, so not individual, but so, that seem to stand for the idea that there's something that falls outside the circuit of exchange. And you know, and it's not because philosophers are ascetics that they refuse money. I mean, I said this before, I think philosopher is like man of pleasure in, in <laughs> Greek philosophy. Like, you know that Thales joke, which I love, the sort of Thales, I, I always thought slightly different reading. But why does he fall into the well? Well, because he's enjoying so much what he's doing. And you know, I mean, you would know this, as Aristotle says, what is pleasure? It's the perfection of the energeia. Hedone is the perfection of energy. So if you're really concentrated on what you're doing, you ignore other things. That's just normal. That's what pleasure is. So I always thought philosopher enjoys so much, of course he's going to fall into a ditch. He doesn't care. Like, you know, in the sense, like, philosopher is somehow, it's not out of asceticism that you refuse. And the funny thing is, of course, the philosopher, like Socrates, you get gifts, honorarium, right? That's what we still have that word today. You get paid as an honorarium. It's not payment. But of course, the perverse thing in contemporary capitalism is more and more we think of our wages as gifts, and this becomes very exploitative, Explo exploitative at some point. But anyway, I just wanted to just hear what you guys think about this very simple question that, like, yeah. In some ways, what's interesting in this question of money and sophistry is to testify to the idea that things fall out of exchange. And like, for example, in the example of psychoanalysis is an attempt actually to pervert money, to make money into the sign of something inexchangeable. I mean, mm -hmm. I think probably the best author on that was like Pierre Klosowski with his crazy mm -hmm. ideas who, you know, let's make money into a simulacrum of itself to stand for what can't be exchanged. But, that's just something I haven't heard much yet in the discussion. And I think, for, at least for me, that was what's at stake of it in this weird philosophical refusal of yeah, wages. Um, but I just wanted to open that. Is that oh, yeah. Take them. I mean, in terms of the artwork, it's a curious thing to say, because in some, mm -hmm. in some sense, there's, there is considerable truth to the, uh, to this paradoxical Adornian claim about art being, the artwork being the absolute commodity precisely because it refuses the simulation of social use that is the bad faith of the commodity. After all, you know, the use value is totally incidental to a commodity. Qua commodity. The fact that I'm drinking this water, yes, it's the you know, empirical support for, you know, the accumulation of the vast amounts of capital by Studena or whatever. Um, but that's, but nevertheless, there's a, there's a constant social, social simulation of use, of usefulness, which blocks the recognition that we're merely like contingent bearers of these circuits of accumulation. This stuff is not made for us, you know, or it is only made for us insofar as we can, we can allow that circuit to take place. And in some sense for, for Dorn, it seems then that the, the, the refusal of, um, the refusal or the suspension of use in the artwork, then, you know, and, and also it's very complex relationship to, to the commodity form. Uh, gives it a, a critical, you know, it gives it a negativity that is not obviously that the commodity itself can bear. So I thought I thought it was interesting that you say, well, you know, there's things that are that are priceless. Um, amusingly, that's the whole term like that. That that whole very uh, it's quite fascinating. Marcel Enough book, The Price of Truth, which is this yeah, historical yeah, sorry, like, That's all. You know, that's yes, of course. Yeah, that, that's all based on the. But, on, this, on, 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 the, on the desire for pricelessness. Right. But that's a determinant negation of price. So that's like, it's not, uh, you know, um, pre-monetary relationships weren't priceless mm -hmm. the, the, because there was nothing to be less about. <laughs> you know, like it's, so th th that's why it's a determinant negation to say that you are, but that you have relationships that are outside of the, they're only outside in and, you know, they're, they're, inc they're in excluded in to what is a, a you know, commodity-based society, basically. Yes, I, I think that the, um, the urgent term to introduce is politics. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, Socrates has nothing to do with politics. It's his it's, it's constant claim. And uh, 
when you say uh, Socrates is atopos, it's perfectly right. He is no, not he is going uh, in the agora, but not for political purpose. Mm -hmm. So he's atopos. That's why he asked to be in the Pritane, in the Pritaneus. When and that's why also uh, he 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 go to death. So um, Theotetus is a very beautiful dialogue because it's. Uh, put in scene uh, at the same time the best Protagoras you can ever see. Uh, it's the, the apology of Protagoras is really the best one. And the, the way Socrates says, um, he will, the, the sophist will never know, or, or the, the, the politic will never know how to throw his uh, motto, his Huh? What do you coat. say? His, his coat. coat, but it's not a coat, you know. His, his mantle. His mantle, mantle on on the on the shoulder, mm -hmm. uh, as a free man. So that's the point. Politics is here at at, uh, at central in the discussion of money. And uh, truth, money, politics. Mm -hmm. So we have to consider what what is a. a, a politics for sophists. So it's, it's really urgent. We didn't speak of that at all. But if we want to, uh, you know, to, to, to be fair to the question of money, we must introduce that. What, um, what, what do you think? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it will be, well, I think that for sophists, politics is a question of logos and not a question of being. I think that uh, uh, this is the main, the, the main answer, you know. And logos is not a question of reason, it's a question of plurality of logos. Mm -hmm. It's a question of logoi, and of um, mixed, uh, mixed logoi. And um, if I had two models, well, we, we have to refer to Plato and Aristotle because we don't know a lot about uh, uh, politics of sophists. We know Antiphon, which is extraordinary, you know, uh, but uh, who, for whom the f he introduced the word politoetai. He says that we, uh, one, a man, we, cit citizenize. It's the, the, the word he, he puts in his, uh, so it's, and that is first, that is first prior to uh, be uh, under the law of nature. The, the law of nature is what you, you obey it in, in, in the privacy. It's very, very, in the secret of privacy. But in the public, you citizenize. And the uh, nature is an escape to citizenship. To citizenship. Very interesting. It, it reversed everything, you know. Because uh, you were speaking, uh, who was speaking of natural law? You were speaking of natural mm -hmm. law? Yeah, mm -hmm. yesterday. Yeah, uh, today. So it's, it's very important to, to see what trick here is here. But uh, sophists think that um, it's just, that's why I could compare it to TRC, to, to um, uh, the birth of rainbow people, because they think that polis is a question of logoi, hmm? and of agon between logoi. This is very simple, and not a question of being. This is why it is so anti heideggerian you know, uh, such an anti heideggerian position. Heidegger thinks that polis is he said, uh, Greek, where um, if Greek invented polis, it's because they never been politics. They never, uh, they, they have never been a political people. Uh, it's because polis means pelein. That's the old word for enai. This is in Parmenides. Mm -hmm. So it's extraordinary, you know, this uh, way of... The old world, old for, word for... for Pelein mm -hmm. and Pelein is the old word. No, it's the word. It's it's on police is on Pelein, mm -hmm. and Pelein is the old word for Enai. Mm -hmm. So it's because the Greek were ontologues that they could invent police. 
So it's absolutely the, you know, the, the, anti-political. the anti-political way of, well, and the point is that for Plato, um, well, politics is submitted to something else than politics. For sophist, politics is just first thing. It's interesting that, uh, that in, you know, you said truth, uh, money, and politics, but then in thinking about the politics of the sophist, the sophist privileges um, logos of a being, but maybe doesn't then also account, um, in the case of something like the TRC, you know, some of Alberto's questions, I think, bore upon this question of, um, well, let's say political economy, mm-hmm. and how that sort of um, liberal discourse maybe can't address forms of power that are not necessarily discursive, mm-hmm. um, and that that's the kind of break that the historical materialism introduces, right, really to attend to political economy and thinking the relation between truth and, uh, um, um, and yes. truth and politics, yes. that money has to... Absolutely, uh, you're, you're right, but the point is that you, you, you have to introduce one more term, that is ethics. And then it it begins again, you know, uh-huh. and and that's uh, absolutely the point also of TRC. Uh-huh. Is it ethics or politics? Yeah. Well, it, it it is only if it is politics that it can uh, make this kind of foundation. Uh-huh. If it's ethics, you absolutely lose everything. Uh-huh. Um, uh, that's that's very interesting, and uh, when when asking yourself. What about this ponderation? You know, uh, you begin to rewrite the history of philosophy uh, with Plato and Aristotle and, and, and sophists. You know, you begin to, to rewrite it. In, the, in well, if it's if it's a way, it, it could be a Deleuzian way. Well, it's. But it could not be a Deleuzian way. It's a Deleuzian way if it's something. But this is this will be a long story. <laughs> well, maybe we should. Maybe we should um, well, thanks again. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you.